Right. Hi everybody, welcome back with us at uh, Popping Brothers So Far So Good series now. Uh, if you are wondering why are we switching back to a Wednesday session, this is in preparation uh, for Phase 2 reopening. So I uh, just want to welcome you again to, for joining us live. So if you're watching from Facebook, uh, Instagram or YouTube, feel free to leave your comments right down below. My name is Melvin Lim and uh, we hope that everybody has been doing well so far. And of course, good news for Singapore, we are reopening to Phase 2. Uh, coming Friday and uh, of course we are all very excited about uh, what's going to happen uh, and uh, for physical viewings to resume I mean especially for the property industry so for those of you out there who are who are prepping to come for physical viewings to take a look at properties because you're looking for homes and stuff uh, you can uh, definitely stand by for this weekend now today we have uh, a very interesting guest and he's an expert uh, when it comes to mortgage loans so i'm very fortunate to have uh, kenneth toe with us i'll bring him uh, on live with us shortly to have a chat today so what we'll be covering today is all about mortgage loans we'll be talking about uh, stuff that probably you might have been wanting or yearning to ask when it comes to taking a mortgage loan or what's the impact of, of the current COVID-19 situation about deferment of loans and or reconstruction of loans for landed properties and stuff like that. So I'm going to ask him a couple of questions later uh, and then we're going to have uh, an enjoyable session. So again, if you are watching uh, live with us, uh, we welcome you to key in any questions and comments, anything you want to ask about mortgage loans, feel free to ask. Uh, we'll, we'll get Kenneth to answer them later at the last portion of this q a series today so uh let me bring up kenneth and then we have a chat from there kenneth hi hello 
Hey, can I find how you have you been? Good, good. Still, I think uh, for the last two months, we see a lot of changes to the market. I think uh, I think everything is going to pick up after this Friday. Right, right. Yeah, good. Good to see that uh, you are you are doing well. Are, are you at home now? Yes, I'm at home. You guys are so, operating uh, from home. Yeah. So currently, for this phase, we are still. Uh, working from home, although we can actually technically enter into office, but a good thing about our business is that uh we can work from anywhere as long as we have a laptop and a phone to engage with customers. So we are quite lucky in a sense. Hi, right. good to hear. Good to hear. And uh, just a brief introduction about Kenneth before I ask him to introduce himself. Kenneth uh, is the the founding director of KeyQuest Mortgage. So he and his team uh they specialize in helping consumers to uh, do comparisons across. Uh, all different banks in Singapore, especially when it comes to refinancing or taking up a new mortgage loan for your purchase. So uh, they're experts in deciphering um, the different kinds of uh, mortgage technicalities when it comes to terms, lock-in periods, uh, whether you are choosing a fix or floating or what is sideball, what is bought rate, what is fixed D rates and stuff like that. So uh, later at the end of the show, we're going to leave uh, some contact links down below so that uh, you have uh, some navigation to to find out about uh, what Kenneth and his team does at KeyQuest Mortgage for you guys. So, uh, KeyQuest Mortgage has been um, uh, partnered with us uh, in helping some of our clients over the years and uh, they have a team of very experienced uh, mortgage brokers. So I think today will be a great session and uh, once again, we welcome you to, to leave any questions later for Kenneth. So Kenneth, why don't uh, you just give a brief uh, backdrop about uh, yourself and your team. Uh, how many people are there, and then and then uh, usually what what do I do day to day basis, and and yeah, just just give a brief introduction to our audience. Okay, uh, thanks thanks Melvin for the earlier introduction. So uh, basically for us over at KeyQuest Mortgage, we have a team of about eight to nine person now. So day to day perspective, uh, basically we are touching base with new customers who actually have some questions about their refinancing or even loan deferment and like the different kind of interest rate package. So we actually uh, do a webinar style uh, through Zoom. We actually talk with clients or over the phone. We actually run through with the customers like, oh, what's the current interest rate package in the market? And what's the difference between like fiber package, fixed deposit rate, as well as bank spot rate? So our role is to basically to educate the client. So when they are making a purchase of their property, which interest rate they should be looking out for or in terms of refinancing what is the better package and we go into very small fine line details like to prevent customer caught off guard uh like um there are certain clause they are not aware and if the banks were to do some changes on letter offer they, they are all well prepared that before they enter into this complex right yeah, yeah. and um yeah, thanks. Thanks for thanks for sharing about about your your main uh, so called service that you provide to to your clients. I think it's very important as well because, um, I mean, if let's say if let's say example somebody is buying a property, usually the main challenge is that um, you, you we have to do an in principle approval before um you actually put down your option fee, right? Let's say if it's it's okay. a whether it's a new launch or is it a resale property, but sometimes. Uh, because the promotion uh, for the bank package uh, interest rates, they, they change every month. So by the time that you commit to a property, uh, the package changes and you have like so many banks to to shop around, you you need to compare and they, there are probably some sometimes some hidden technicalities and differentiation that you might not be able to see at the front. So I think uh, having an expert helping you to decipher and explain uh, will definitely help. Uh, although there are definitely a couple of websites that are very useful as well on, on the Singapore platform. But I think also having an uh, expert to give you the opinion and advice, I think I think that's that's uh, fantastic. So Kenneth, just want to ask a burning question, right? I mean, uh, I mean, since the start of Circuit Breaker, this has been one of the, the burning questions that a lot of people will have is that should they uh, go ahead and take the deferment uh, relief uh, from uh, Singapore MAS uh, on the mortgage mortgage uh, payment every month until end of uh, December thirty first, twenty twenty. So, so what are the pros and cons for doing that? Because uh, we we know that you know when you do that, definitely there will be a, a slight increase in in the interest in totality for the entire tenure. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can you can give an advice on what what do you usually advise your clients when they ask you about uh, this? Payment? Okay, so I think that uh, what I think is that. 
for some clients, it definitely makes sense whereby they want to have managed to have a better cash flow for the next six to seven months. Because, um, example, if your monthly installment plus the interest you're paying about ten dollars ten thousand dollars a month by doing a deferment for six to seven months technically you free up an additional cash flow of 60 to 70k okay so to some business owner or to some individuals it might make sense because uh i have another 60 to 70k to play around within the next six to seven months so i have an additional cash flow rather than to put into the mortgage uh that would be probably the potential upside uh like what you mentioned the downside is that you achieve the the, although you don't pay installment for the next six to seven months uh and the interest is still calculated in so that means this six to seven months of interest right will be recomputed to your next year uh principal sum so example if your interest is two thousand dollars a month six months is 12k and your outstanding loan is one million so basically next year your outstanding loan will, will be one million on top of that, you just need to add in the twelve thousand dollars interest and recompute out based on the remaining loan tenor you have. So the amount of interest you incur, uh, you technically you basically you incur more interest, but in terms mm -hmm. of cash flow versus twelve k versus your saving of six uh sixty k over six months, it, it it does make sense for some people. Hmm. Yeah. So your recommendation is that for people who probably um needs uh this this six months period to maybe manage their expenses for in terms of their business especially for business yeah. owners in this situation where where they can't operate under the, the circuit breaker um or maybe for people maybe one of the spouse has lost their their job or something like that then uh it'll be an advisable move like, is that is that what you are referring to yes that's right so this yeah. is uh this is for the government has came out this initiative to help some singaporeans in the event that like what you mentioned that uh, either the spouse or themselves have a loss of job or they can't operate their business, then mm -hmm. this relief is very helpful because uh, they will have a better cash flow within the next six to seven months. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. I, I mean, uh, of course, the, the, the total interest calculated will increase, right? Uh, and it's based mm -hmm. on the entire balance tenor. But of course, sometimes people don't don't live in one property uh, all the way. I mean, they, they yeah. might myself after five years or, or eight years and stuff so technically the amount of interest increment is also uh, quite manageable lah, right and yeah. um coming to this i mean how, how is the covid 19 situation i mean uh in the in the mortgage loan industry i mean uh we've spoken to our our lawyers uh partners i mean they've shared like you know naturally i mean because uh in terms of compensating plus mortgage loans they're all tech and packed yeah. to the transactions in the property industry so it's like all interlinked right and uh transactions definitely has dip in terms of the resale market and 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 launches and stuff so how, how about your end i mean what, what what do you see on the ground in terms of the amount of new take-up rates and also has there been an increase in the amount of people taking doing refinancing because of the very low interest rate environment now uh what we see over the last few months is that the number of purchase transaction uh has actually dipped quite a fair bit i would say uh based on our business itself we see a drop of uh 40 percent uh 20 to 30 to 40 percent in terms of this but we actually see a surge in the refinancing market because uh we can see because after uh in the market when us announced uh they're slashing interest rate to zero percent and cyber actually has come down quite a fair bit from january the cyber package was about 1.8 and it has dropped to about 0.54 percent now so we can see wow the the, the dip of the cyber has went down and a lot of people are taking this advantage to do a refinancing and because all the banks are coming up with very competitive package to attract customers to do refinancing at this period so overall uh in the whole market what we see is that although purchase uh are lesser but we see more inquiries on the refinancing and people want to find out like which bank has the best interest rate, how much mm. they can spend. So we actually do up calculations for consumers that if they switch from example, a housing loan from HD mm. housing loan, 2.6 to bank loan, how much they save, or even mm. for their existing current bank. So uh, mm. I would say quite a substantial increase on the refinancing market. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, talking about refinancing, um, 
um definitely this this can only be done after your lock-in period is is up right and uh you guys i mean um you guys are able to do refinancing for for uh consumers but repricing will have to be done within the bank itself right am, am i right to say yeah. that correct if it's repricing that uh the customer need to contact the banks directly uh mm. to assist on that yeah so so we, we we also always advise our clients that uh every time to decide whether you do a repricing or refinancing after your locking period is to calculate the amount of costing involved versus the interest saving. So, uh, because doing refinancing, there will be costs uh, such as the 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 new legal fees plus sometimes uh, a new valuation report fee and stuff. But of course, if the interest savings over the next two to three years, uh, vis a vis this cost is so much more, right? Then it will make sense to switch, right? So, uh, kind of like in in your own uh opinion, right? Because we we know the bank loan rates changes every month, and they change at different dates across yes. different banks. So, are, are you able to maybe just uh hint like you know for this particular round this month right now, which are the top three uh most attractive uh rates from from the, from the banks? Um, in terms of fixed rate, uh, we just uh we just saw a new package coming up. Uh, the mm. fixed rate we are looking at uh, all time low. Uh, before today, uh, the fixed rate we are looking at is about one point five percent for two years. Uh, but one of the partnering uh banks just came out with a new package that they are able to offer up to one point three eight for two years fixed rate wow. package. Yeah. Okay. And, Depending on loan amount, uh, we might be able to negotiate to a 1.3% fix for two years. Uh, but if customers who are uh, who are more risk effort uh, and who will want to bet against cyber and continue to go down, so I would think mm. cyber package we are looking at maybe about first two years at 1.19 mm. uh, or the next two years. So like what you mentioned, uh, some of things uh, when you are looking to do refinancing, what are the things you need to take on all are the cost of uh, legal fee as well as valuation. So the good thing mm. about uh, in today's market, as soon as it's a refinancing, the bank mm. are allowed to give out some perk like uh, cash rebate or legal fee subsidy. So it actually lessens the burdens of the client paying up front cash to do their refinancing. And convincing mm. fee now, for refinancing is within uh thousand five to thousand eight, and for valuation, mm. all the customer need to pay about maybe it's a range of three hundred to five hundred. So, with the uh, subsidies the banks are giving out, at times the client only just need to top up a couple of hundred dollars to do the refinancing. Right, right. Yeah. So going back to the the two packages that you mentioned, right? You you're talking about the one point three eight percent, and then if yeah. let's say the loan amount is, is is of a larger quantum, you might be able to um negotiate up to about 1.3% for a consumer. That is a, a lock in two years. Um yes. and it's a it's it's fixed, but is it packed to cyborg or is it not packed to cyborg? Is 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 it a bot rate or, or like a fixed D rate and stuff? Um this is a pure fixed rate which will not fluctuate uh uh based on market sentiment. So the good thing is that if interest rate is on the upward trend, uh you are not affected. You are still locking in. But the downside is if the the interest market is still on the downward trend then you are paying slightly more premium. Right. Oh, okay, sorry. I, I was trying to ask for the the other one that you mentioned, the 1.15, oh, the, the very attractive 1. one. 9, okay, 1.19 1. 1. 1. is, yeah, it's a cyborg package. So the right. bank threat is about 0.65% plus hmm. 0. 0.54, which add up to about 1.19%. Right. So this is a floating package and there's no lock-in. Uh, it's a floating, but there is also a lock-in of one to two years. Right. So depending on the on the type of package that you select, right. So of course, if uh if you are just joining in with us right now, with uh so far so good at property brothers, we have Kenneth To from KeyQuest Mortgage with us. He's an expert when it comes to comparing mortgage loans uh across the board, and because mortgage rates uh are fluctuating, especially with the US Fed rates reducing their interest right now. Um, so Kenneth thinks that it's a good time to do refinancing if you're planning to do that. And of course, he and his team, they provide a service of helping you to, to compare across board uh, with different banks, different promotions every month and stuff. So uh, later, if you have um, interest to find out uh, what his team can help you with, there's 
uh, going to be a link later that you can um, take down or there's a QR code as well. So uh, we'll flash the links right uh, down later. So uh, also, if you just join us, feel free to leave your comments for questions later. We'll be happy for Kenneth to answer your question. So Kenneth, um, we, have, we have a very burning question for a lot of uh, buyers, especially since we roll out uh, some of the landed um, so-called like uh, interviews we have with some of the, the builders and stuff in so far so good. Okay. So some, some people they are asking about reconstruction loans when it comes okay. to buying older landed properties to tear down and rebuild, right? So a lot of um, listeners, they want they want to know like a little bit more in-depth about recon loan. So um, maybe some some uh, key questions about reconstruction loan is that like... Um, Usually, how how much can somebody let's say somebody buy uh, a landed interterrace land right for maybe about two point uh, I just say probably two point five million uh, and then um, based on this two point five million they are taking they are already taking a seventy five percent loan twenty five percent down payment uh, how much reconstruction loan can they take on this house if they want to tear down and rebuild and let's oh. say if a builder quote them uh, about a million dollars to rebuild. So out of this one mil, how, how many percent can they take? Uh, usually for reconstruction loan, depending to bank to bank per se, uh, mm. it's a range of 50 to even up to 75% of the rebuilding cost. So may right. I say, example, if the quotation from the uh, builders is about one mil, so maximum they can go up to about 75% financing for the construction loan amount. Mm. And... Uh, the good thing is about construction loan is that uh, the loan tenor is not uh, same as your housing loan. Because today, if you purchase a property and you are at the age of 65 years old, so okay, if you are age 40, the max loan tenor is 25 years because for purchase, the loan tenor kept at age of 65. But mm. when you get a construction loan, uh, you can actually offer a longer loan tenure, which uh, based on which uh, 40, you can actually go up to 30 years for the construction loan. Okay, what, what is the calculation method for the tenure for recon loan? Uh, it's usually up to 875 years uh, old or maximum up to 35, 30 to 35 years, depending on banks to banks per se as well. Oh, I see. So they're based on 75 minus your age, but max cap at 30, 35, depending on your TDSR and stuff. Lah. Yes, that's right. Okay, so uh, the recon loan requirement is it still strictly based on TDSR or they, they look at other 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 things as well? Uh, the reconstruction loan, the uh, one of the factor is TDSR, but the mm. way of calculation is slightly more slightly more stringent compared uh, because they use a higher interest rate as a stress test for construction loan rather than when you purchase with residential, they use TDSR and they have a stress test interest rate which is three point five. But for construction loan, we actually use a higher stress test level of uh, 5 or 6% for calculation purposes. Mm, mm. So um, what you're saying is that some, somebody buys a, a lender for 2.5 million, right? They take a mortgage loan. And then on top of that, they they take the uh, reconstruction loan. So these are two separate loans. Um, yeah, and right. um, of course, they, they work on separate monthly repayments, right? But um, what about when when somebody wants to sell their property um, after five years? Uh, what happens to the recon loan? And and like, is there any penalties? Is there any lock-in period? Like minimum, you have to occupy your lender for how long before you can sell so that there's no penalty from, from repaying back the recon loan and stuff? Okay. So for reconstruction loan, interestingly, uh, uh, number one, as I mentioned earlier, is the loan tenor is longer, but mm. the interest rate is actually higher also, depending bank to banks, I would say for construction loan, it range from four to six percent. Uh, mm. But once, uh, once you start to build and once the project TOP, right, the construction loan is actually added back to your housing loan, and you will enjoy the same interest rate as your housing loan. So that's the uh, good thing about construction loan that after once the project TOP, you will be converted into third into a housing loan. But mm. the downside is that during the building phase, uh, whereby you're paying the money installment for the construction loan, number one, you can't use CPF. So the amount has to be payable while cash only. So once it's converted, then you can switch. Uh, once it's converted to a housing loan, that's where you can start using CPF to service the loan. And for construction loan, usually do not, they do not have a lock-in period. They will actually follow your housing loan 
per se locking. So example, if you do a rebuild, it takes about maybe one year um, for the whole process to be completed. So if your housing loan is locking is two years, so at end of two years, you can actually do a refinance or even up to a four years mark when you sell, there won't be any penalty incurred for this construction loan anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so technically what you're saying is, is like the same. I mean, for example, let's say somebody wants to buy a landed property that's brand new and it costs them uh, in the market maybe about 3.8 million for a new built in the terrace. But uh, they're thinking of having their own design and they have the time, probably one and a half years to do this project. So they, they buy a, a old land, 2.5 million, and then spend another one mil ought to build it and take a 75% loan on that one mil. So technically it's, it's the same as buying a three over million dollar property because the, right. the loan is covered. The, so the, the only kicker is that during your reconstruction period, if it delays, then the amount of interest that you pay during that, that construction period is, is higher, right? Because your, your, your installment, does it kickstart immediately? when you take the recon loan or it kicks out only after TOP or, or does it kickstart during the construction phase? Uh, for construction loan is similar to a building under construction property. Uh, it's going to be progressive drop down. So like example, when a builder has completed a certain phase on the construction, uh, mm. they inform the lawyer. The lawyer will actually inform the banks to draw down uh, the payments for a developer. So it's going to be progressive draw down. Right, right, right. So it's a disbursement kind of arrangement. All right. So it's like if, if your construction is one year, so your loan will actually be dispersed out within the next one year. But something mm. to take note is that uh, let's say if you are getting the max 75%, the initial 25% has to come out from your own pocket first before the bank start releasing the uh, construction loan. Mm. Got it. Right. Yeah, I think that, that clears a lot of air, especially for, for buyers that are planning to do some um form of reconstruction uh kind of plans uh down the road and i think it's, it's very useful information thanks thanks kenneth for that uh we have um one more, one more very interesting question right is that uh i think this this will pertain to buyers that are buying property for the first time mm -hmm. and sometimes um uh we, we have heard like you know like buyers when they already plan to buy a property but uh, because of the probably the, the lack of planning in advance, uh, their TDSR suffers and that uh, delays the time for them to commit to a property. For example, somebody already planned to, to buy a property, but midway, they, they change jobs, right? They change jobs. Uh, okay. and, um, their, their income salary slip is, is, is resetted and then it affects probably the, the credibility towards the bank part. Or maybe somebody commits to buying a new car, right? Just right before one month later that they're planning to, to buy a property. So uh, what are some of the tips that you have for first-time buyers when it comes to um, uh, protecting their TDSR, uh, especially when, it, when it's, it's on the route to buying their first property? What are some of the, the tips and then some of the, the ways to, to ensure that your TDSR is healthy and stuff like that? Okay, a few things is that number one, one of common things we usually advise clients is, let's say if you are looking to purchase a property within the next few months, so your credit card spending actually is taken into TDSR calculation. So what we advise is either you minimize the usage on the credit card or uh, within like the next one to two months, you just focus on spending on one credit card. So some of, we, we also have this experience that some clients actually have five or 10 credit cards uh, with them and because each credit card has some cash rebate air amount for this so they, they typically spend on each card 500 500 or a thousand to enjoy the perks uh, the banks are giving so this actually becomes a, uh, a calculation when the banks look at it that you have 10 credit cards they will have an ag aggregate exposure for all these credit cards so this will actually reduce the uh, amount of loan you can use because if you have uh five or 10, 20 credit cards you have in your pockets. So we'll advise clients who are looking to purchase the property for the first time, you might want to take note uh, on the credit card spending or focus your spending to one card. And making late payment on your credit cards also uh, affect your scoring when the banks look at it. Because uh, to the bank point of view today, if you are a non-good pay master and every time you take 60 days, or 90 days to pay your credit card, they will be concerned because a credit card maybe is in thousands, but whereby your mortgage loan, you have to constantly 
uh, pay this amount every month, will you have the servicing ability? So these are some of the things consumer want to take note before you purchase, uh, making on time payment on your credit card, uh, minimize your spending on your credit card. And like what uh, you mentioned earlier, Melvin, like for car loans, uh, we we don't recommend you purchase a car uh, before buying a property. Uh, mm. It's just within that few months because that will also eat into your ESR calculation. So mm. these small little things will be computed. Another common one we see nowadays is like a lot of clients uh, see this kind of credit card promotion whereby they have zero interest rate for six months and uh, you don't need to pay uh, anything within the next six months. This is also considered as a commitment uh, to the bank's point of view that you when you get, have a line of credit, you utilize, you just need to pay a minimum down every month. So all these uh, credit cards, car loans will actually uh, if affect uh, the eligible loan amount you will be able to secure as well. Right. How about job change? I mean, like as um, just now when we explore about job change, like if somebody is planning to change their jobs, right? Um, how many months later uh, will they be eligible for, for a loan? Like, or it depends on the kind of job that they're taking and, and stuff like that. Like, what, what is your advice? Okay, so based on our experience, if the company is like an MMC, usually mm -hmm. we just need a one-month pay slip and um, salary grading and CPA contribution. The banks are able to take it. But if it's a SME level, uh, usually the banks are more comfortable with at least a three months uh, pay, uh, CPF contribution and salary rating before uh, they assess the client. So mm -hmm. if they're looking to switch between jobs, um, so probably they want to plan it out as well that they want to, if it's an FMA industry, probably you have to be applied for three months before you can actually apply for a job. But if it's an MMA, then that's not much of an issue. Usually it's about one month. Uh, before uh, the banks will be able to recognize their income. Right, so it's either one month for big firms or three months for, for SMEs. Uh. And how about like if somebody is, is working overseas, right? They're, they're Singaporeans uh, working overseas, drawing overseas income, uh, and then uh, they want they wanted to leverage and take a, a mortgage loan for a property in Singapore. So, so how does that come into play? Like how many months of uh, pay slip or, or what kind of method, salary crediting or stuff like that? Usually for overseas income, let's say if it's a Singapore working overseas, the banks usually want to see at least a six months pay state uh, and six months salary creating. But at mm. times it might go up to 12 months as well, 12 months of pay state and 12 months of salary creating before the banks will want to assess or even take in the client's income. Mm. Mm. So yeah. is that six to 12 depending on the on the the profile and, and, and stuff? Yes. So it, it, I would say it is quite similar whether the, usually if it's overseas, most of the time we see the, a bigger firm, MMP, uh, it's just that sometimes the banks will want a longer period if the clients has been um, in the overseas for more than one or two years. Sometimes they just want to make sure that the salary is consistent over the last 12 months. Mm, yeah. Right. Right. So, um, what what do you think of the market? I mean, for the for the rest of twenty twenty, right, and and moving forward to twenty twenty one, what what do you think of the the market pertaining to the interest rates environment? Will will rates continue to stay low, or is there a chance that rates will increase? And and yeah, what 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 do you think? I mean, recently we we're just doing like some um some tests right on on different kinds of interest rates, uh, for the initial mortgage, right? So. Uh, I mean, for example, I mean, if we were to compare a, a interest rate at one point five five percent versus two point five five percent, the amount of um of money money mortgage that someone is paying towards the principal and interest is uh so much more when the interest rate is low in terms of the the principal uh repayment portion. So um, what what do you think? I mean, personally, do do you think that the interest rate will will go up in maybe one to two years time? Like, what what is the interest rate kind of prediction? Uh, it's actually a very tricky question, but based on uh, my personal opinion, what we see is that uh, high chance that the cyber or the interest rate market should remain low within the next twelve months. Uh, I don't. I we we don't think that the interest rate will rebound within yeah the next twelve months. But after mm -hmm. twelve months, it's also depending on how's the recovery on 
the whole market in Singapore as well as globally. Because if uh, if we still see uh, increase of job loss or this, then potentially I doubt the interest rate will go up within the next 12 or even up to 24 months. So I think it's a global impact for this round. Uh, there is also a high possibility that it can remain low for more than one year for the interest rate wise. Mm, right. Yeah. And, um, I mean, definitely the interest rate is one of the very key component when it comes to a, a property uh, purchase or investment decision, right? Because yeah. that, that will determine what is the, the kickstart phase of the, the mortgage loan and, and stuff like that. So um, what, what is your usual advice? I mean, people will ask you like, hey, you know, should I take a fixed rate uh, for two years? Or maybe I should be a little bit more um, adventurous and I just follow the, the flexi rate and have a three month cyborg and stuff like that. I mean, what, what is your advice? Or how I mean, do this uh, as, a, as a consumer, like should I go for the fix or should I go for floating? Okay, I, I will usually share with the clients the pros and cons. Like uh, if you are on a fixed rate, uh, you are going to be very soon for the next two or three years. Uh, mm -hmm. And technically, if the markets increase, you are not affected. But if you are on a floating package, example for cyborg, all in you are about 1.19 versus a fixed uh which is about 1.3 plus now um the buffer is quite minimum and less cyber continues to roll on the downward trend if not uh it depends on the customer risk appetite so if they are someone who are very safe and do not want to monitor their interest rate for the next two three years or even up to five years uh they should go for something which is good but mm. if they are slightly more risk adverse and they don't mind uh, to actually uh, continue to monitor on the interest rate within the next six to 12 months, they can actually go for a cyber package, uh, which is currently, we see that it's still on the downward. Because the lowest on um, three months cyber we saw before was about in 2009 to 2013, it was about 0 0.3 to 0 0.4%. So that is a potential that uh, the cyber might be still going towards that that past uh, low uh, which we saw before. Mm, mm. Yeah. Right. Right. So um yeah. So so your 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 answer will be really based uh, on firstly the the risk appetite right of of the of the consumer yeah. plus. Uh, after explaining the terms and uh, end of the day, I mean, it's the choice of consumer or which one to, to go to, right? So I, I think we have a question coming in. Uh, maybe we can take one question in the meantime before we head on to the rest. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we have the question from Wilam. Uh, let me just read out a question for, for those audience that um, might be listening from Spotify and, and Apple Podcast. So uh, Wilam asked, the spread for bank loan is 0.8 to 1% plus three months sideball. One of the local bank come up with a fixed rate of 1.5% for five years. Which package will you recommend to your client? Um, I mean, if if we were to recommend, right, um, I would say it depends on the risk appetite again. But of course, in terms of figures and number, uh, if you look at the banks, if the if the bank spread based on his scenario, right, uh, all in is about one point five because if the bank spread is about 1% plus 3 months time is about 1.54. That definitely makes sense to go for a fix because usually based on market trend, fix is always higher than a uh, floating package. But for his for this scenario, if it's 1%, then you're paying 1.54 or in a cyborg, then it definitely makes sense for me to recommend a fixed rate because it's lower. But if the spread is 0.8, the difference is, uh, is 1.34 you have a slight buffer of 1.1 percent then maybe uh it depends on the retail appetite again i might actually recommend the client to go for a fixed rate because it's just 0 0.1 plus percent difference but if today we can open up the gap of um to 1.16 to versus 1.5 uh then i think it might make sense to look into the cyber package because you have room for buffer for cyber to increase over the next two to three years you have at least a 40 basis point to play around mm. yeah right yeah and um i mean of course and this is also for five years 
Um, so, I mean, it's like locking in for five years, which, uh, I mean, one over percent is really considered one of the, the lowest in, in the entire world in terms of mortgage rate, right? So, um, yeah, I think a lot, a lot of consumers are, are taking this time to really uh, shop for rates when it comes to refinancing. And um, so, um, kind of just wanted to ask you, right? Hmm. Uh, what is what is your view? What is your view on um, like mortgage insurance? You know, I mean, uh, over these few years, of course, a lot of people they are they are comparing taking the traditional mortgage insurance versus the term uh, kind of insurance, right? Because technically, they serve the same purpose. It's just that the mortgage insurance um, coverage reduces with a mortgage loan. So, what what is what is your take on that mortgage? insurance versus term insurance okay so for mortgage insurance is that uh what it, it is tied to this subject property only and uh like what you mentioned is reducing based on the outstanding loan amount and the premium comparing to the term insurance will be slightly lower as well uh versus a term but for me, uh, my, myself, actually, I opt for a term insurance rather than a mortgage insurance. Uh, it's because, example, today I am 30 plus. By the time if I sell my property five to 10 years ago, five to 10 years down the road, I need to purchase another mortgage insurance. And by then, my premium might be higher. So if mm. I opt for a term insurance, uh, my personal perspective is that it is uh, I do not need to purchase another round in five to ten years when I sell my property. So mm. uh, it depends on customers whether they want to have a lower commitment on the installment for the insurance or they prefer to invest upfront for a term whereby it's a straight line. If I'm not wrong, uh, my understanding for term insurance it actually cover uh permanent disability whereby a mortgage insurance doesn't. Mm. Mm. So what you're saying is that um if let's say example you're buying your first property and then let's say if it's like a 1.5 million dollar property and then you take a 75 percent loan right so um technically when you take a term plan uh, it covers the entire uh, amount and it's a straight line for the entire period uh maybe up to a certain age lah. but uh what you're saying is that if you go for mortgage insurance if you sell the property the, the mortgage insurance is tacked with the property that's and right then you, you when you buy the next home you have to redo the the new health check and things like that if it's needed but a term once it's done it's done and no matter how many properties you switch in between uh the the term is, is still there it's still valid in a sense la. yeah that's right yeah. but of course that will depend on on your next few property choices la. i mean if you buy bigger quantum properties you need more coverage yeah. then you have to probably take more term issues so, okay we have another question coming from uh Willem again thanks Willem for for your question so uh, Willem is asking if I'm earning 200000 per annum now and uh, I'm able to take on a $1.8 million loan uh, to purchase a new new home, but two years later, my income dropped to 80000 per annum. Would the bank deny me from doing a refi, a refinance? Uh, okay, I think this is a very interesting question. Um, the good thing about refinancing recently, uh, MS has actually reduced... Uh, the criteria they actually have waived TDSR. So today, if let's say your income has dropped, but you still hold the income and you are able to service your money installment, even your TDSR is 100%, 200%, or 300%, the banks are still able to take in. Because we just did for a client a refinancing just about one to two months, uh, her TDSR was about 300%. The banks are still willing to take in her refinancing, even though he doesn't meet the criteria. So mm. as long as you can prove some servicing ability that you're able to pay your money installment within the next 12 to 24 months, the bank for refinancing is usually less stringent compared to a purchase. I, I doubt that will be a bank who deny, but there might be certain criteria which you need to fulfill in order for the bank to take in on the refinancing. Right. So, Kadam, the, the example that you just mentioned is is um, particularly pertaining to right now the COVID-19 circuit breaker, right? Because, I mean, uh, the banks are now a little bit more lenient when it comes to refinancing on the TDSR uh, check and stuff like that. But what about, like, you know, before the circuit breaker? I mean, if this situation occurs before the circuit breaker, before COVID-19, right, uh, when somebody has an income drop, 
would they take a full assessment of the the income for TDSR when it comes to refinancing? Uh, even before COVID nineteen, as long as the subject property is owner occupied, uh, mm. the banks are able to do TDSR up to hundred percent. Oh wow! Okay, so there's a little bit more more lax on that that portion. Yeah. And the good thing is, at the point of time when you do refinancing, you can choose to extend your loan tenor for, depending on age, uh, you can extend probably another 10 years, up to 10 years uh, for refi. Because refi, you can go up to 35 years or up to 35. So imagine you're 40 years old, you get a 25 years, but refinancing, you can actually shut up to 35. Your monthly installment will drop. Therefore, it might also make it easier for you to refi your properties. Right, how about, how about um, so you mentioned the TDSR is a little bit more relaxed for own state property. How about investment property? If let's say Willam is talking about his, his second property, I mean, well, how would the refi situation look like? Um, okay, so if it's before COVID, uh, if it's an investment property and you don't fulfill the TDSR, the banks will actually require you to pay down 3% of your principal sum in order to switch from bank A to bank B. But with this COVID-19, our government also has introduced a new measures that uh, for investment property, uh, even if you do not meet the TDSR, you are able to refi um, and you do not need to pay down 3% to, refi to refinance the property. But I would say the TDSR might not be up to 300%. The banks probably will look at if it's an investment, probably maybe within 100% of the TDSR. Mm. Yeah. Right. So um thanks uh we done for the questions. Uh I think it's, it's, it's these are these are great questions. Uh and uh kind of so one hot question, right? I mean we always like to ask our guests during this period is that uh I mean we, we interview people from 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 different industries relating to the, the real estate industry. So with the, the current uh, pandemic, I mean circuit breaker, COVID nineteen, and then of course, I mean like in the US we see like 40 million unemployment uh job losses so far and stuff, and then of course mm -hmm. like um Singapore there are there are like companies closing down as well over the last two months. So uh just want to check with you like, I mean what what is your what is your point of view? What is your opinion about the the real estate market? And um do you think that uh if we, we balance we balance everything right we balance everything uh like recently we just did two episodes on our investors uh series season season two uh where we we balance out all the scenarios um and the fundamentals of singapore property market in terms of how many rounds of cooling measures that we have the interest rate environment uh the profile of buyers profile of current sellers who are the different groups of people uh, affected and stuff like that so uh what do you think i mean do you think that the prices will come down do you think that it will stay probably stable or flat or, or what do you think what was what's, what's your what's your own uh, opinion on on the property market in terms of maybe uh, we're just talking about the private property market okay um, yeah. i would think for property private property markets uh it should still remain stable uh i i would think that for resale market it might be slightly on uh flat but for new launches i don't foresee uh the price dropping but maybe the developers will actually throw in some perks or discount to entice buyer to purchase uh because i think with this COVID thing um the it can, i i what i see before COVID 19 is like a seller market uh, mm -hmm. a seller has a stronger say on the price they want but after this pandemic uh, i think it becomes a like, more towards a buyer market uh, it depends on what the buyer wants to offer. So, mm. so what we see is that uh, it will be stable uh, in terms of Singapore property market. Uh, I don't foresee a, a dip uh, in in this market. But I would say more on it will, it will be more like a stable market for resale. Right, and uh, yeah, I think I think there's there's there has to be a balance of factors because. We, I think one thing that's working in favor now is the, the very low interest rate environment, right? So yeah. uh, that makes uh, entry to, to the market uh, easier in a sense. And of course, I think with uh, the current pandemic, a lot of foreign buyers are also um, 
looking out for, for countries that has, has very strong healthcare system and, and stuff like that to, to park their funds and physical assets and stuff. So uh, I, I think, um, yeah, I, and a lot of people are also looking at, you know, what is the impact of QE from US uh, for the past two months? I mean, with the stock market uh, uh, moving up after a very short uh, dip. So I, I think, um, yeah, if you have not seen the, our investors uh, series season two episode one, you can head over to our channel on, on YouTube, have a look at the, at the episode where we analyze the fundamentals and, and try to balance out the factors and, and stuff like that. So uh, kind of we have another question coming in. Okay. Let's take this question, right? So um, Chai Chu is asking, uh, what is the condition to fulfill for equity loan? So uh, I'm assuming that this question is pertaining to asking about equity term loan um, or, or uh, yeah, it's, I mean, there, there are several other terms on, on this. So yeah, maybe kind of you can, you can give your take on that. Okay, so if it's in the event that the client is looking to take an equity term loan from the asset, uh, it's possible, but it's only applicable for private properties. And the equity term loan, uh, if you talk about the condition in here for you, uh, is that you are still subjected to TDS. Uh, it's like buying a new property. Uh, you still need to fulfill the 50 percent TESR before the bank will want to grant you an equity term loan. In terms of interest rate, it will be similar as the housing loan, which is at uh, one over percent. Uh, and the equity term loan is also up to 75 instead of 65 years old. So, Chai Chu, I hope I answered your inquiries regarding the equity term loan. Yeah, so um, usually how long after, let's say somebody buys a property right now, 2020, year 2020, June, somebody buys a property right now, usually how long later can they take an equity term loan? I mean, provided uh, there's some appreciation in value or uh, draw, I mean, like if, if, if the mortgage vis-a-vis -vis the, I mean, there has to be a difference, right? I mean, in the amount of yeah. mortgage versus the, the value of the household, how long, what is the time period? I would say usually it's about six months because the banks want to be able to see your repayment ability mm. and um, are you prompt in terms of repayment for them to assess. So most banks, what we understand is that uh, they want to see the repayment uh, ability for six months before uh, they will look into granting uh, equity term loan for the client. But mm. some banks might be doing even up to one year. So it depends on bank to banks per se as well. Right, and uh, is this loan tech? Um, you mentioned it's, it's packed to your mortgage interest rate, right? So yeah. uh, will, will it be a lump together kind of installment payment or it will be two separate installment payment? Uh, it will be two separate installment because for equity term loan, right, uh, you can only use cash to service the money installment, whereas a housing loan, you can use CPF to pay for it. So the banks will usually uh, segregate out which is your housing loan and which is your equity term loan. Uh, to yeah. determine right so but this is only applicable if your property moves up in value or probably you have been servicing your loan for a couple of years and then there's a, a difference in in the new valuation vis-a-vis -vis the amount of uh outstanding mortgage and there's a spread there but i uh, think note that you will have to less off the amount of cpf plus accrued interest that has been used in the in the property and that has to be taken into consideration because a lot of people miss out on that on that portion yeah that's right okay. Right. So, um, thanks. Thanks for the question, uh, Chai Chu. So, I, I think uh, kind of maybe we have one last uh, one to two question, right? So, um, what what do you also think of um, maybe like the trend? You know, the trend uh, based on the amount of loans that you've been doing over the years and stuff like that. Uh, in terms of new new properties versus resale properties, um, if we are talking about the private condo market. So in terms okay. of the amount of loans that you've been dealing with, right? What is, what, what is the trend of um, people buying in Singapore over the past two to three years? Is it more towards a new kind of uh, launches uh, or resale or, or is it actually quite a balance every month? Uh, for over and out, when we see more um, transaction on the new launch and we see on the resale market, we do this. We do see transaction moving, but it's not as fast as the new launch. And a lot of people are buying a new launch for investment as well. So we see a lot of husband and wife, they own an existing private, and they actually did a decoupling to purchase another private property for investment. So mm. I would say that uh, the transaction should be on 
more towards the new launch comparing to the resale market. Mm, mm, yeah. Right. So, so you are seeing like slightly more uh, skewed towards the new launch market per month. That's right. Yeah. Right. I think in terms of statistics, it's about uh, fluctuating between about 50% um, each month. I mean, some months are higher, some months are lower. So it's about half the transactions for private market is, is for new launches, half is for resale every month. That has been quite constant for a couple of years. Lah. So yeah. I, uh, I I think, of course, I, as, as Singaporeans, a lot of people also prefer uh, newer projects. But of course, those people that are looking for space and immediate occupancy, then uh, existing resale projects are also a uh, uh, favorite choice as well. So that is, I mean, that, that there's different drawbacks. Lah. I mean, you, you might need to rent first while waiting for it to be completed and stuff like that. And that's another topic altogether. So uh, you talk about decoupling just now. So when uh, you, you mentioned that this is also on the uptrend and of course that we, we know that this has been the trend for the past five to six years already. Uh, yeah. When somebody decouples and then they do a refinance on the existing loan, right? For the person that's remaining, taking over all the share, while the other uh, spouse comes out to buy another property, right? So when they decouple, can they also take an equity term loan during the entire process? Uh, yes, they can. So in the process when they are doing decoupling, uh, mm. if there is buffer allowed, so like what you mentioned earlier on, uh, we need to take into consideration the CPF usage um, mm. uh, being com uh, based on the loan amount, uh, being an outstanding and CPF usage before the banks will be able to grant you an equity term loan. And mm. in this process, we can do everything together. That means we, sh we shift from one bank to another bank to restructure up a new loan on buying over the spouse 50%, as well as taking up an equity term loan and refinancing whatever outstanding you have with the current bank as mm. well. Yeah. Mm. All right. So uh, I think Chai Chu is, ask is asking um, a follow-up question as well on the buffer that the bank would need to have. Um, so for example, maybe to, to facilitate the question better, right? Is that, for example, let's say uh, somebody bought a property at 1 million, all right? And then they, they take a 75% loan, 750,000 outstanding. And then let's say after three years, right? They have paid down the loan to 700,000. So the, the outstanding mortgage is 700,000. And let's say there is no CPF usage, it's all cash down payment. And then the property appreciates to 1.2 million. For example, so I think Chai Chu's question is that um, what is the amount of equity term loan that uh, they can take? So and and, and is it packed to the same seventy five percent and stuff? Uh, yes, it was. It, we were the banks will actually reassess based on the new valuation of one point two. From there, mm. it will be a max seventy five percent loan, uh, minus of whatever outstanding loan you have. The balance will be the buffer the client will be able to take an uh, equity term loan on. Right. Yeah. So it will be the same uh, 75% Chai Chu on the new valuation, less of the outstanding loan. And uh, this scenario is, is if, let's say, you didn't use any CPF, but of course, if you use CPF, it will be less of the CPF plus accrued interest and stuff. Right. So uh, also for decoupling, um, a lot of people also do not know that actually there are, there are fees involved and decoupling yes. leads legal fees are, are slightly higher because there's like two sides of the transaction and stuff so uh, i think one 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 thing that uh kenneth and his team can definitely help you is that if you uh i mean have any questions for them they can help you to work out the sums entirely and stuff like that of course that um property brothers team our consult team can also help you to do the calculation when you are switching between portfolios and stuff like that all right so uh thanks kenneth i, I think this session has been great uh we have a couple of uh, good questions coming in and stuff and uh, thank you all for your take on the market and stuff. So we're going to flash um, some of the, the links that you can look for, uh, Kenneth and his team at KeyQuest Mortgage. And then uh, I think there's a QR code coming up. Yeah, you can scan this QR code or take a photo of this QR code and scan it at a later part of the day when you're free. If you want to contact them, ask about mortgage advice, comparison of rates and, and how does that service work when it comes to uh, preparing your TDSR and then taking a loan for your for new home. Kind of you guys do IPA as well, right? In principle approval. Yes, yes. We uh sometimes we actually assist to do an indicative over the phone. Just give them a rough ballpark figure and mm. follow up by uh approved and visible from bank so that the client is more assured uh before they commit to the case they know what is the loan amount the banks will be able uh to grant. 
Mm. Yeah, and, and I think one thing I really like about KeyQuest is that uh, you guys work as a team, right? So, uh, like whenever a, a customer has has a has a loan requirement, immediately you guys set up a chat group. There'll be a couple of people inside handling the paperwork. Uh, you giving the advice and stuff like that. So I think the benefit of working as a team is really there's more support when it comes to making a loan decision. And yeah. um, also, uh, if you, you guys have not uh, probably seen some of our episodes over the last weekend where we had our Check It Out series, uh, we have launched our Telegram uh, channel. So uh, head on to our te Telegram channel, sign up for, for this channel where we keep you updated uh, on the latest uh, real estate content and, and some news and, and articles and stuff like that. So you can uh, just sign up and then just head on and, and keep yourself updated. We also have a weekly newsletter. So uh, head on to our website, uh, click on the newsletter link. You'll be able to subscribe to our weekly newsletter that we keep you posted on the Singapore real estate market as well as as well as some of the content that we have. Also, this episode at So Far So Good is available to be viewed on uh, Spotify and uh, also on Apple Podcasts. So you just need to download the app uh, here over the Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You'll be able to see So Far So Good. We also have another uh, podcast called Nuggets on the Go where we share tips daily. So uh, all this information is also on Property Brothers website. So head over to our website and all the content will be there as well as on, on our YouTube channel. So kind of once again, thank you very much uh, for coming live with us. We appreciate all the, the sharing and opinion. Yeah, it's, it's been great. And then we'll see you around and take care. And for, for those of you out there, um, of course, I, I know a lot of people are standing by for Friday uh, for phase two reopening. So uh, uh, we just, just want to wish uh, all Singaporeans uh, and our friends uh, uh, from, from different parts of, of uh, Asia or the world, uh, just to keep yourself safe and take care during this period. So we'll see you soon and on our So Far So Good next week again. All right, take care. Bye. Okay, see you guys. Everyone stay safe.